Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to Java One on, I suppose, the first proper morning. And uh, welcome to my talk on uh, what's new in the next version of JMS, JMS 2.0. As it says there, my name is Nigel Deakin. Um, I, I work for Oracle. I'm a developer in the Glassfish, message, the Glassfish team uh, at Oracle. Yeah. And um, I also am a specification lead for JMS 2.0. That's JSR 343. And uh, we start, as you probably get used to by the end of this uh, conference, to uh, a short, mer short message from my employer. So we'll click to accept. And uh, the next commercial message is just to advertise. I'll be uh, speaking uh, with a, a number of other members of the JMS uh, 2.0 expert group tomorrow at a boff uh, in the, that's not this room, I think, that's the one just around the corner, um, tomorrow afternoon. So please come. Um, that'll give it. Please come if you have questions and uh, make, want to make comments. That, um, that we probably have more time to talk about those then than we do now than we will today. So let's just get straight in and uh, talk about JMS. Uh, I suspect that. Uh, well, does everybody who knows what JMS is? So I don't think that uh, that's good. So I, I, it was good that I deleted my my slides to tell you what JMS is, but. Just a few basic uh, what it is and what it isn't, which is worth remembering in the context of talking about a spec, is that it's a Java API for sending and receiving messages with many completing implementations, uh, which um, actually makes it quite different for quite a few other specs with a few other implementations. There's a, long, there's a large number of commercial implementations of JMS, both open source, co closed source, commercial, uh, community, um, and uh, uh, people are making money out of it. Um, as far as the JMS, it's con JMS itself is concerned, there's, uh, it might not be completely obvious when you uh, come across it, but there's actually two slight variants, distinct variants on the JMS API. There's the API that you use in uh, Java SE applications, and there's the API you use in Java E applications. Um, and that the distinction between the two is not always apparent, and that's one of the goals of JMS, is to make that clear. But the, uh, uh, just to um, uh, elaborate slightly is that... The, Use, the use of JMS within a Java E application, by which I mean the web container, EJBs, the application client, adds uh, support for XA, JTA transactions, of message-driven beans, and uh, perhaps somewhat confusingly, it also removes some things that were considered uh, inappropriate for use in a managed application server environment. Uh, just one more slide on what it is and what it isn't. It's a standard API, but it's not a JMS Messaging, it's not a messaging system in itself. You know, some people say, where can I buy JMS? It's, it's just an API. And it's not, it's not a wire protocol. It's purely what the application uh, developer writes to uh, send and receive messages. It is a Java API, um, as it's a JSR standard. And it doesn't define an API for non-Java clients, like C++ clients or perhaps a web, web API. Um, that doesn't mean they, you can't have, a messaging system can't have those clients and indeed many, if not most, implementations do have something like that. But that's not sort of within the scope of what JMS itself is. The J is a bit of a giveaway there. Um, and uh, one final thing is, is uh, perhaps describing what it is at the moment rather than what it has to be. It's an API for applications to, uh, to be developed in. Um, it's not particularly an administrative API. It's not for writing management tools. It's not for writing monitoring tools. All these APIs exist, but they're not standard within JMS. So that's not necessarily... There's no reason it has to, it doesn't have to be like that, but that's how, a, that's what JMS is at the moment. It's basically an application API. Okay, JMS 2.0, which is what we're here to talk about. Um, well, JMS is quite a long established, in fact, po possibly one of the most longest established of the Java E, um, or indeed the Java specifications. It uh, dates back to uh, the turn of the century. Um, and uh, rather unusually amongst, ver uh, uh, amongst, um, what I'd say, a successful, well-used APIs. It's uh, not been changed for a decade. Um, now, you can come to your conclusions about whether, why you think that is. Um, where, uh, but I'd like to say the reason it hasn't been updated for 10 years suggests that the people who wrote it got it pretty well right. Um, and because it's not been updated, but that doesn't mean that there isn't, I mentioned in the previous slide, that there's a lot of existing applications, uh, existing uh, implementations already there, still being developed. So it's not as if it's moribund. I think it shows the success of the original JMS API, and in particular, actually, its simplicity, um, its small size, the fact that it is, is, is uh, proven the test of time. 
Um, but time goes on and things do change in the computing. Quite a lot's changed in the last uh, decade, um, particularly in terms of uh, programming um, uh, features. And it's time for JMS 2.0, uh, which uh, as a, um, a specification initiative, uh, it's, been, uh, uh, being, it's been worked on in the spec, um, in the, well, uh, uh, the expert group for a little bit, little bit over a year now. Um, it was launched, um, I said, JSR 3, uh, 342 uh, last year as JMS 2.0, and there's an expert group containing about 20 members, including most, though not necessarily all, of the uh, JMS uh, vendors, um, and uh, it's not finished. Um, the, uh, there has been an early draft available. Um, there's a link there that tells you where to find more about it, and I'll be telling you more about what's available on the, uh, that website, jmsspec.jav.net. Um, but uh, it's not finished, and the, uh, so what I'm describing here is relatively settled, but it's not, you know, it's not finished. It's not an approved standard quite yet, though, um, though after a year, I'm feeling quite confident that what I describe is, um, is what's going to be in there, subject to that. Uh, disclaimer at the start. Um, the final release is planned to, uh, of the spec, I should say, and therefore the SDK and the RI uh, is going to be aligned with Java 7 and um, the, uh, it says Q2 there, and the, uh, uh, my uh, manager's manager's manager said April yesterday, so I think I'm allowed to say that as well. Um, April next year for the, um, for the spec to be released and the SDK. Uh, obviously, commercial implementations will come later than that. So uh, the goals of JMS 2.0 um, have changed over the uh, year, but it started off, uh, but well, the goals now um, aligning with, to some extent, the goals of, of Java E 7, which uh, uh, those of you, I expect most of you who went to the technical keynote yesterday, uh, our simplicity of ease of use is the one that's highest on the list um, in the uh, keynote yesterday for Java E, and that's the same for JMS 2.0. And in particular, to catch up with the ease of use features that's, that have uh, overtaken the, the rest of Java EE in the last decade. Um, but obviously, it's a messaging system. There's a scope for new messaging features. I think there's scope for far more than there is at the moment. Um, Java EE integration was something that I think is, is basically ignored by the existing uh, spec. And, e and even though, obviously, all Java EE application servers do contain JMS, it's not terribly well defined in every case how they should interrelate and exactly what the API is when you're writing an application in a, uh, in that, to run an application server. So uh, clarifying that, uh, standardizing that, and making JMS providers more pluggable between um, uh, application servers is another goal. Uh, finally, um, minor corrections and clarifications, inevitably with any spec that's 10 years old, it, there's small features, but I'm not, which I'm not really going to talk about that. Those there, that if you want to read those, they're listed in the spec. Uh, one change since the, uh, the project was set up initially uh, is that the, uh, the, a year ago, the goal of Java 7 was to embrace the cloud and platforms as a service, um, but uh, in, um, to reflect the changes made in um, uh, Java generally is that the uh, move towards cloud and PaaS features has been deferred to Java 8. Uh, right. So uh, issues like multi-tenancy within a JMS provider, that's been, which we had been discussing earlier on, that's now deferred until basically that the, the platform as a whole is addressing those features. Okay, let's, uh, let's, get, more, let's get on into the, um, the, the detail then. And uh, I'm going to spend quite a lot of time uh, talking about the, what, we've been what we, the expert group, um, have been doing to try and simplify what actually is quite a simple API already. Um, and uh, although I think JMS 1.1, that's the existing version, 2002, is a pretty good spec. You know, that tr uh, yeah, I've said it uh, uh, proves the test. It's um, the test of time. It's, uh, um, it's worn well. But uh, there are some things that uh, I'd like to say are sort of wrong or, in hindsight, perhaps uh, could have been better. And, um, oh, some code. About time too. Slide 11. We've got some code on the screen. That's better. This is just a trivial example uh, of a, I suppose it's a little bit of a fragment of a, of a session being running in, in Java EE to send a message. And um, uh, i just like to just simply just, I, I hope everyone is familiar with, uh, with this, I think, but um, I'd just like to take, through, take you through a few, make a few comments on it. Um, so 13 lines just to send a message. 
Obviously, that depends on exactly how you, whether you put your closed braces on a separate line or not. So I don't want to sort of labour the point of numbers of lines of code. But there's quite a lot going on there, given that the real action is in red, which is when you're actually sending a message. Um, Uh, so let's just uh, look, look at this a little bit more detail, is that uh, what you're doing to send a message, this, me this method that basically takes a string, text string, which I'm calling the payload of the message, and, try and wrapping it in text message and then sending it to, to, to the JMS server. So what you've done, you've actually got to create a connection, a session, a message producer, and a me text message object, all just so you can send the message. So that's four, four objects you have to create just to send the message. Uh, and I'm going to say, really, that does it really need, do you really need to create so many objects? Um, one of those objects you have to create is a session, JMS session, and to do that, you, the, the, the API is to call the create session method on the connection, and you pass in two arguments. Um, and uh, there's a lot of scope for confusion there. Um, two two main, main issues with those two arguments. One is that um, they're actually not independent arguments. The first argument specifies that it's transacted, and the second it specifies that if it's not transacted, what the acknowledgement mode is. And um, those two are not clearly independent, so really why are the two separate, um, uh, uh, two separate uh, arguments, two separate parameters? It's sort of fairly trivial. Far more, rather more important is that actually, if you read the EJB spec, it actually says, in that particular case, where you've got a JTA transaction, those arguments must be ignored. So what, your for, so what the poor developer does is he thinks, oh, I'm specifying to be auto-acknowledged. But in fact, that's always, by, according to the EJB spec, that's ignored. And the, uh, uh, the session that you create actually follows the uh, JTA transaction. So at the very least, even if you know what you're doing, you've got to lie, basically, because you've got to put something in there. And, uh, and that's just, again, it's just a, a non tidiness that uh, I hope you can clarify. Uh, just to label the point slightly is... Boilerplate code, because this code is almost the same, whatever you did. You know, you're always crea creating a connection, connection factory, always creating a session, probably with the same arguments or none. Uh, always creating, a, in this case, present, if you're sending a message, you've got to create a producer, and then, um, uh, well, there's actually more. You've actually got to create the message itself, which is the line, first line in black below it, and then you can send the message. Uh, and then, um, perhaps... Yep, uh, almost, uh, almost got to the end of this. Uh, yes, then you have to close the connection after use because a connection is a valuable resource. It either re reflects a connection to the server or even if they're pooled, you have to return it to the pool after use. Otherwise, you run out of them. So you've got to call close in a finally block, which is a bit... just clutters up the code. It's not complicated, but it just clutters it up. And then finally, you've got to do exception handling. Almost every single method in JMS, no matter how trivial, even if it's just getting a message property, is always declares that it throws JMS exception, which means you're forced in the code to catch it. Otherwise, it won't compile, or else declare it as being thrown by the method. So it just clutters up the code quite often when you don't actually know how to handle a message, because every single method potentially shows a uh, could throw an exception. There's, you don't know what, what you, you wouldn't know how to handle it, even if you you wouldn't know how to handle it. So uh, all you typically can do is just uh, log it, or else possibly rethrow it. Um, just bail out. There's not, 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 not very much you can actually usefully do quite in a lot of these exceptions. Okay, so what are we doing to simplify the JMS API for JMS 2.0? Um, well, the first, um, first thing is, is that backward compatibility is an issue here. We've, uh, obviously, we have to, what we can't do is just change the existing API. That's the sort of nine rule of any of these specs. Um, is that we don't want to, I should say, rest assured, expect anybody to change their code for it to work in the JMS2 environment. That's, you know, that's, that, that's, a, that's a criterion for the, for the spec. And if we discover that, that it had been necessary, then that's a mistake. So um, it, gives us, it gives us limited scope to actually change the existing API because of, we can't just delete code. We just can't remove uh, methods, for example. Uh, so there's a sort of two-pronged two, um, two approach. One is to uh, try and simplify the existing API. What, what the phrase existing, of course, implies there's a new one coming up. Uh, but basically, so um, uh, simplify the existing API where it won't break compatibility, but also to define a new API, which is basically easy to use, we'd, uh, we, we hope. And the objects that, uh, the interfaces that uh, I'm going to be talking about 
are all are called GM as context, GM as producer, GM as consumer, and I'll say more about that um, uh, fairly soon. Um, and the, uh, the third prong of the um, uh, strategy is um, to exploit injection um, of resources, uh, which is new, new um, as made available by CDI, Context and Dependency Injection Technology, which is now part of the Java platform. So exploiting that to allow these objects, the GEMS context object, to be injected and managed by the container, which um, uh, rather than expecting the application to do it. So um, just going through those quickly, uh, the, uh, taking the first of those then is what can we do to simplify the GEMS API itself, GEMS 1.1 API, you know, those, the, the things that are already defined. There's limited scope, but, the, uh, but one small change is to perhaps tidy up that method I complained about earlier, which is create session, taking two arguments. Still exists, will always exist forever, but a new, I said those two methods are sort of not independent, so actually you could have a single argument version which had just contained the same information. It's just a little bit easier to, to understand. And in Java EE, or the, though you can actually use it in any case, a method with no arguments, which just simply has a take, follows the default um, behavior, which in the case of a Java EE transaction, if you, it, that's the method you could use, because that just means I want my session to uh, follow the, the JTA transaction, so it'll be committed when the container commits the transaction, or transaction manager commits the transaction. Um, still talking about how we could simplify the existing API, I mentioned the, uh, the need to actually call close whenever you've used well, any of these objects. They're really the con closing the connections, the one that matters. Um, uh, what we can do here is take advantage of a new feature call, uh, in Java SE 7 called auto-closable API. And what that does is it allows you to use a syntax like this to um, save, you the save you the bother in the application of actually calling close. So um, I'm not going to describe in detail how this new, f the, basically the try with resources, auto-closable feature of Java 7 uh, basically allows you to, uh, uh, to use that syntax where in a try block, so there's a new, between the round brackets of the try block, which you sort of, new in Java 7, is you can actually create these closable op resources. Um, connection, create the session, create the connection, and the, create the producer. And then when the block in the braces comes to an end, the JVM will just call close on those objects. So, you, so in a sense, it's just, you still have to define where it's closed with the closing closing brace, but uh, it just means that the container, that the uh, JVM will take care of, uh, of calling close for you. So it just makes the code a little bit simpler. So what if I don't want to close it in the particular uh, Then you, if you didn't want to close it, then don't use a block like this. Just use, use the same API you use now. So you're not, yes, this is not removing the ability to call close yourself. If you wanted to cache it in a field somewhere, <coughs> yes, you can still do that, but then don't use um, essentially, that, that syntax has got an implicit close at the end of the first brace. It also means that if you get an exception, when you're closing it, it gets handled with a single exception block, and it's nested not nicely. Just, um, it's just generally a little bit tidier. But, um, so that's one, but basically any book, Java SE, Java EE, that, that's just an optional new feature you can use as well. Um, so let's just talk about... Um, the new simplified API then. So I've talked about how you could change the existing API. Let's talk about the uh, new features for, um, uh, essentially the new API that's going to be made available in GMS 2.0, um, which as I mentioned earlier, is, is based around three new interfaces, three new objects, a GMS context, a GMS uh, producer, and GMS consumer. So, and here's an example. I'll just give you the example initially um, of the use of the, what I keep calling the simplified API, which is probably one of those phrases that, um, uh, it's sort of um, a hostage to fortune, but I'm calling it, I'll call it the simplified API to compare it with the ex existing API. They'll both run alongside each other. And when I call it the simplified API, it's meant to be simpler to use. It's not simpler in functionality. Everything you can do with the old API, you can still do with the new API. Um, and uh, you, know, you shouldn't have to quickly switch back to the old API just to do something advanced. So, uh, but the thing I just wanted you to see here is you're sending a message. There's still a method send down there. And... Um, but the number of lines is, you know, if we're trying to have the headline figure, uh, what were 13 lines before is now five lines. Still some exception handling there. So let's just look at this in a little bit more detail now, rather busy slide. 
But the main thing is, is uh, we're using this try uh, with, resor with resources syntax, I should say, first of all, because this new object, gems context, you need to close it after use. Um, but because it implements auto-closable, we can use this syntax to, um, to save you having to write that. So you're creating a gems context from a connection factory. So instead of creating a connection, you create, call a method to create context to create a gems context. Um, and uh, that's, so the gems context is basically, in terms of the old API, you can think of it as combining the, or encapsulating a connection in a session. Uh, the next, so that's, you've got the gems context, then what do you do? You want to send a message and send, well, you want to send a text string in this example that you've passed in and you want to send it. So, well, the li next line code, the uh, line of code below, context.createproducer.send and then you pass in the name of the queue, or rather the queue object, and then the payload, notice the, uh, the text string directly. You're not creating a message here. Sorry, you're not creating a message object here. You're just passing in the string and saying send it. So the idea is, is that you've got, you didn't have to create the text message there, basically. Um, we've still got the uh, catch block here because you might want to catch exceptions. You know, the same exceptions will be thrown, except it's a different type of exception that's closed now called a runtime, JMS runtime exception, which is an unchecked exception. That's the type, like, runtime exception that you don't actually have to... The compiler does not force you to catch it. If you, if you don't, it'll just get passed up to the caller. So, um, so in, some in many cases where all you do is log it, you don't quite know how to handle it, log it or possibly rethrow it, then um, you can actually le often leave the exception handling out completely. So now, this is basically we're giving that capability to, to just ignore exceptions, essentially, and let the calling method catch it if you want to use it. Or you can just catch it like it is now. Uh, and then finally, I think the last point was, yes, there's no close here because we're using the auto-closable feature of a gems context and wrapping it in a try block like this, try with resources block. Hello. Yes, please. Yes, that the produce the I will just say in a moment, I'll talk about the producer in just a couple of slides time. But the uh, it's like a you can think of it in terms of anonymous producer under the old API, where you um, you pass in the name of the destination each time. I'll just come back. Uh, I'll talk about the producer in just two slides, if you if I may. Um, but I'll just talk about the, just recap the James context first. So this is new object. So you can think of it as encapsulating a connection and a session. Of course, exactly how it is implemented is up to the provider, but I think it's uh, certainly logically you can think of it as being the connection and the session together, two, one object sort of two, and also an anonymous message producer. As, as I was just saying, it's the, uh, you can, in the old API, a message producer the op is the object that you used to send messages. When you create it, you can either basically hardwire it with a particular queue or topic, or else when you create it, or else you can create it to be anonymous which basically means you pass in the, the, uh, the name of the cure topic in the send method. And in the case of a gems context, you can think of the gems context as of having inside it when it's created or lazily a connection and a session and a message producer ready for use, as it were, when you, um, to send a message. Uh, how do you create it? From a connection factory. We're not trying to bootstrap it from anything else. So there's a new method on connection factory, create context. And you, and you pass in a session mode, which is very much like the acknowledge mode. Um, when you create a session. So you can say it's tra transacted, auto-acknowledged, dupes okay, um, uh, or client hack. Just, you know, effectively, you're creating a session there, so you have to specify what it is. And there's actually an argument. There's a variant that doesn't take any arguments. Uh, this is because it's wrapping a, these valuable objects you've got to call close after use, or, indeed, or else you need to wrap it in a try with resources block, and then the JVM will close it. And then I'll say a little bit a bit later is the other useful thing about this is you can inject it into a Java e web or EJB application. Now I just said that um, it, uh, because it encapsulates a connection and a session in one object and that's a perfect fit for Java e because in Java e applications you're only allowed to have one session for every connection. Um, so, but in Java SE or indeed the application client you can create multiple sessions on the same uh, uh, connection. Just remember the point about a session is that effectively 
defines a thread of control access to the um, uh, the resource of the connection. So if you want to have two threads working on a connection, using using a connection to send or receive messages, you have to create two two sessions, which you can only do in Java SE. But if you want to do that, you can do that. Um, you basically want to create a second JMS context that basically reuses the same connection of the existing one. So just the way the API works is you create the first connect context as described in the previous slide, and then you can just say, give me another context using the same connection. So that's a method to create context on the first context. So, and then finally, what do you do with this JMS context? Obviously, what you really want to do is you want to use it to send and receive messages, so you need to create JMS producer objects for sending messages and JMS consumer objects for receiving objects, receiving messages. Uh, and then finally, I, I, I mentioned that a design goal of these new APIs is that every method, as, much, as far as possible, methods are not for, don't force you to catch exceptions in the code. So all the exceptions they throw will be unchecked. Subclasses of runtime, JMS runtime exception. Okay, moving on to the JMS producer then. This is, uh, this, is the method, this is the object that holds the methods to send and configure the messages you're sending. It's intended to be a lightweight object and uh, essentially it's very similar to a, uh, a message producer in the, uh, the existing API. So what you do, you can see there's two examples which are, look the same. Uh, so from a session you call the method create producer. It gives you, in JMS 1.1 it gives you a message producer and you can call the send method on that, send the message. You can do the same in JMS 2.0. The difference, show, the difference, though, is uh, more evident if you want to do a bit more than just send a message. If you want to, for example, set various, what I'm calling delivery options, like you want to specify whether the message you're sending is persistent or non-persistent, or you want to send the JMS message priority, uh, or you want to send the JMS time to live on the message, the expiry date, expiry time, um, or how long the me message will live until it expires. In JMS 1.1, you've got to uh, you've got to have a variable that contains the message producer, and then you have to call all these methods one by one on it, and then you can use it to send the message. So that's JMS 1.1. So the forces you to have, the API forces you to have a variable which is the message producer, because you've got to call several methods on it. And um, in JMS 2.0, the API is just very slightly different in, in that the, um, all the methods on, uh, on, the, on the producer object will return the producer object. So you can chain them all together. So set delivery mode, for example, it, whereas in JMS 1.1 on the message producer, that just, that's a void method, it doesn't return anything. JMS 2.0, it returns this, it returns the uh, context. So you can just ch chain them together. It, uh, so it's sort of syntactic sugar, I suppose, but it does mean you don't actually have to, at anywhere there, declare a variable which is going to be the producer object. Um, uh, uh, another uh, feature of the JMS producer is just slightly different to this, is that if you want to send message properties, um, in JMS 1.1, you send a message, a message property, you set message properties by um, uh, creating the message object and then call methods like set string property, set boolean property to, to, set, to set them, and then you pass the message into the send method. JMS 2.0, we're actually allowing, you can still set those properties on the message. However, as a sort of convenience, you can also set those message properties on the producer object. So that means you can just add the method set property to this chain of calls. Um, so in that example, in this example here at the bottom, we're, uh, we're creating a producer and we, we're setting a property foo to bar, that, what that's, and then sending a message. And what that's actually doing is saying, when you send the next, indeed subsequent messages, we want the messages to have its foo property set to bar, where the, that these are just arbitrary properties. Um, now, why would we need to do that? Well, it's, I suppose it's perhaps a little bit uh, to make it more consistent with the other ones. What it also means is that it then allows us to have some new, uh, in fact, I'll go talk about them in just a second. It allows you to create some new um, uh, methods that allow you to pass in the message payload as, as a parameter directly. So that example there, the bottom, you're, you, when you get to the send call, you're passing destination, and then just a string hello in that case. So what, that's do, what, that, what that method will do is it will, uh, in turn, it'll create a text message and set its payload to be hello. It'll also set its property foo to bar, and then it'll send it. So again, so we're saving the need to actually create the text message here. You can still create it if you want to. Those method, that API is still there, but you can uh, um, just this sort of... Uh, 
you're not forced to by the API. So in a sense, in that whole line, the only variable you actually have to ha declare is the context at the beginning. You don't have to declare the message producer. It just gets created. And it's a lightweight throwaway object. You don't have to close it. And then you don't have to create the message object as well. Uh, these are the methods on producers to send the message payload directly. This is a feature for four out of the five existing JMS message types. You may remember, um, well, just going through that, the, the, uh, you, the, uh, if you pass in a, a map of a string against an object, it'll create a JMS map message for you. If you pass in a serializable object other than a string, it'll create a JMS object message. If you pass in a string, it'll create a, message, a text message. And if you pass in a byte array, it'll create a bytes message. The one missing there is a stream message, which doesn't quite fit in. If you want to create a stream message, you just have to create a stream message and write to it as, using the API. Uh, and as I said, bec because you're not actually creating a, at any point in the actual message, you don't actually have visibility of the JMS message object here. That's why if you want to send things like message headers, um, message properties, you, you can set these all on the JMS producer object. Okay, now it's talking about consuming objects. Um, this is actually, there's less change here. Because um, essentially there's a new object called a JMS consumer object, which in many ways is really much the same as a message consumer object. So um, it's much the same functionality. So uh, if you wanted to synchronously receive a message, you create a JMS consumer object. You have to pass in the destination, just like now. And then you can call the receive method to, uh, uh, in that case, that receives a message with a timeout of 1,000 milliseconds. Uh, if you want to receive messages asynchronously, you create a consumer, or JMS consumer again, and in that case, you set, it to, you, you, uh, you set a JMS message listener to the existing API. So there really is no real difference. One difference with this, though, is that if you create a JMS consumer here, it'll automatically start the connection. I don't know whether you've uh, hit it, but uh, in my um, uh, work, one well, part of my job is to monitor some of the uh, user forums for um, users of our product, Oracle, and uh, one of the commonest errors is people, um, particularly people who haven't used it very much, so, and Glassfish, of course, has a lot of students and people who, who aren't familiar with the JMS, who they, they call all the API, and then they're waiting for messages, and they say, why aren't I get, you know, why, you know, here's my code, and they give you a big code sample. Why aren't I receiving any messages? And what I always do is, even without looking at the code, I say, did you remember, well, I did look at the code, do you remember to call connection.start? That's the method that actually turns on message delivery to a consumer. So it's just a trivial thing that we all get used to remembering. But in terms of simplifying it, is that the JMS consumer um, is that that connection is automatically started for you. Um, if you, for some reason, don't want to do that, you can configure it so it doesn't. And conversely, with, uh, I mentioned that you could uh, send a payload directly using JMS producer. There, are con conversely, you can receive when you're receiving a message synchronously, you can receive the payload directly. Um, so uh, in that, the way the API works there is you pass in the, the name of the string, that you're, the, the name of the class that you're expecting, essentially. So if you're expecting it to be a text message, you can call receive payload and you pass in string.class. And, and then it receives as the text. Then it receives, you, receives a string. And then the, what it returns is a, is a string. Um, you don't need to cast it. So what you're saving here is the need to, to, is to receive a message, to, ca to, to cast it to the appropriate type, and then to get the payload out. If you know what the payload type is, you can just call receive payload in one go. You be well spotted. That's the, the, the main drawback of this is that you, because you don't uh, see the message object, you can't access the message headers this way. So you have to decide, in fact, tell me whether you think this is useful, but it's... Um, uh, so whereas with sending the payload directly, you, do, you, ha you aren't losing the functionality here, you are losing the ability to look inside the uh, message headers. If you have any suggestions as to how to simplify the API so you could, please tell me. Uh, and there's an example of receiving message payloads directly. Okay, now, uh, so I've just talked about the JMS context object, which you can create explicitly using J create context. Uh, if you're running in a Java EE web or EJB container, is a new feature that's going to be added is the ability to inject it into your code. Um, so, yeah, so that, that's, and that's a simple example. And 
uh, I think if you wanted to sell this, you'd say, ah, oh, do you remember it went around from nine lines of code to five lines of code? Well, now it's gone down to one line of code. Um, though, um, that, though I've skipped the message, the, uh, um, there's, no, there's no try or create here. There's no try block to create, it, to create the object here. What you've got here is just a, um, uh, is, in fact, let's go, oh, you said the picture, is that what we're doing is we're injecting the JMS context into the application. At inject, then there's an annotation that defines the, mess the connection factory, and then private James context context. So, um, uh, so that's injecting the James context in your object. You specif it, that's injecting the James context into your uh, session bean, say. Uh, you're specifying the connection factory you want in the normal, J uh, the normal, EJ, normal uh, Java UA through the JNDI name of the uh, connection factory. Um, and then, once you've done that, um, the container will take care of creating it for you when it needs, and the container will also take care of closing it at the end when you've finished with it, essentially. So there's no need for an explicit call to close. There's no need for an explicit try with resources block to basically tell it when to close it. The container will know when to close it. What do you mean? Yeah, I'll explain. Uh, why it knows when to c in, a, in the next slide, but uh, let's just look just a little bit more in the at the uh, API to um, uh, inject to gems context. Um, first thing is is the first the simplest version of it is just at inject private say gems context context. You haven't specified a connection factory here. That's using the uh, uh, a new feature of Java EE, which is a platform default connection factory, which is going to be built in. Um, so obviously, nine times out of ten, particularly in simple examples, is you is that the, the container knows where the JMS is because the JMS is part of the um, the app server. So if that's what you want, you don't need to bother with connection factors at all. You just say you just inject the context, and it will know. Two slightly less common uh, variants is that if you want to pass in the specify effect of the arguments to create context, especially the session mode, is you can declare them using a session JMS session mode. Um, annotation, and if you wanted to pass in username and password, which again <coughs> effectively uh, parameters to create connection at the moment, is that uh, you can pass them in with a JMS password credential uh, annotation. So that's really just, I mean, the reason those are there is because the existing API, the non-injected API, requires those to create connections and sessions. So we don't want to lose any features, whether you use that or not. So that's how you can specify those if you inject it. Now, I said that when you inject a JMS context, the container will take care of when to close it uh, and when to create it. And uh, I don't know, I, can I ask how, whether, how familiar, uh, would people here describe themselves as knowing what CDI is? Okay, fair, fair number of people. Um, essentially, c c context and dependency injection, it is the technology that is being used to implement the injection injection of this JMS context. Um, and the key thing about, so basically CDI, t CDI concepts are used in, you know, I, the, the, well, the, the spec is defining this in terms of uh, CDI con concepts. And the most in, important concept here is the scope. What the scope defines is essentially once, <coughs> once the container has created the JMS context, how long does it live before it gets closed? And the other thing it, um, the scope defines is if you've created, essentially, if you have two different beans, for example, you know, one calling the other, and they both inject a JMS context, if they're both being called within the same scope, and all the annotations to, 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 to qualify it are all the same, you actually get the same object. So you could have one session bean sends a, injects a context and use it to send a message, calls another uh, session bean, which also injects a JMS context and uses it to send a message. If they're in the same scope, then you actually get the same object under the covers. Um, and what that means is you effectively get the same session, um, which can be more efficient within the transaction. Um, essentially, the... Um, essentially, the, 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 uh, the, contact, the connection in which this wraps which effectively the JMS content encapsulates, can be pulled by the container if it wants to. So in a sense, that doesn't change. So um, 
Uh, so you say so. Well, you said you said pooled. So obviously that's the reason. If it's a pooled object, if basically the JMS context has a pooled connection in it, the fact that that's why that's why you need to call close after use because that's what returns the connection to the pool. And so what I just uh, jumped over the, fir the first uh, bullet point there is what is the scope? Well, in a JTA transaction, the scope is actually the transaction. Um, so effectively, JMS contexts are transaction scoped. Uh, CDI does not define such a thing as a, tr as a transaction scope at the moment, but uh, the JTA API will do as, as part of the Java EE. So what this means, though, is that then you, when you inject it, it uh, uh, when it first it gets injected, um, in fact, you, when it's first used, a JMS concept were created, and then it won't get closed until the transaction is committed, which obviously will be typically in the session bean at the end of the method, um, and that's when it gets returned to the pool. If there's no JTI transaction, well, we can't have transaction scopes, so it's just request scope, where request scope is, has, a, has a clear defined meaning in CDI. So that's basically the, uh, uh, what I was going to say about the new simplified API. This is introducing JMS context object, JMS producer object, JMS consumer object, effectively doing much the same thing. In fact, exactly the same thing as existing API, but just a few small changes to the API that we're hoping is making it simpler, a little simpler to use, in particular to reduce the amount of just boilerplate code you have to copy, you re reuse every single time. Yeah, please. Okay, yeah, it's okay. I'm sorry, I can't quite hear. Yeah, absolutely. So that's so. This is um, I did slightly gloss over that. <laughs> is that um, I've said in a Java transaction, the um, uh, the arguments to create session are ignored. Therefore, in um, if you if you weren't injecting the JMS context, what you you wouldn't actually need to specify a session mode. Well, a session mode, I'm talking about whether it's transacted, whether it's client acknowledgement, dupes okay, or auto acknowledge. So normally you don't need to specify um, the parameters to create session. However, in the and this is some, something that I wasn't going to talk about, but in the in the JMS spec, we're trying to clarify a little bit, is that if you're not in a JTA transaction, then the parameters are observed. In particular, um, in particular, you can specify whether it's dupes OK or auto acknowledge, and that's when you would want to specify a session mode. Well, you might want to be able to specify a session mode. But yes, in the normal, in the normal, if you're in a JTA transaction, even if you specify session mode there, that would be ignored. Yeah, sure. Uh, no, I don't see if I need to send a message. Yep. The session. You don't see the session objects. That's encapsulated. Well, if you're using this API, you never have a session object, object in your code. But yeah, you still have the object. Um, so is there a much simpler API, uh, which kind of provides a facade? It says, like, I say, uh, JMS broker, right? I say JMS broker dot send message, and all that I do is pass a queue name and, uh, and, and my message. Uh, that, first of all, I'll say that um, there are a lot that this is not the only way you could have invented the API, but this is what we've come up with. But perhaps if I can ask you, I just said you heard the question, is basically you were, you were saying, can you simplify the API even, even more? Even, even more simple. one liner, you know. Uh, I mean, it's a pretty dumb question, but probably. Well, uh, it, I, perhaps the answer is, can, can you come to the BOF tomorrow? And that's, that we'll probably have a little bit more time to explore some of these issues, I think. I probably ought to carry on. I mean, you ask a perfectly fair question. Um, and indeed, that's one of the things I guess I'm asking is, is get is to some feedback on, uh, on what, you, what you think of that. Um, because this spec will go out formal draft. And uh, I'd be interested to see what the uh, feedback is to this. <laughs> Obviously, one point about this is, this is this is meant to be complete and it's implementable. Um, but again, it's above tomorrow where um, there should be t time for more discussion, basically. What I'd like to get across in, 
this, this talk is just what's basically going to be written, is, is written into the draft spec as it stands at the moment. And then, please do, then I'd love to have lots of comments on it. So thank you for that point. So um, uh, I'd like to move on from, because um, uh, we're, well, I've taken some questions, so I, I um, perhaps I don't need to worry about too much time at the end. But the, um, uh, before I finish, I do want to talk about some real messaging features that we're adding um, to, um, uh, to JMS. Um, so this is, this, is, this is just, I suppose they do, this one is, uh, so, so we've got a, a mixed bag, basically, of, of features now. I'd just like to go through uh, one by one. There aren't too many of them. The first one is about an ease of use feature for durable subscriptions, is to make durable subscriptions easy to use. Uh, at the moment, durable subscription to a topic is defined by client ID and durable subscription name, which you have to specify. And the change we're going to make is uh, you no longer need to specify the client ID if you don't want to. So basically, it's a tuple that defines the your subscription name at the moment, and that'll still continue if you want to. But if you, uh, if, you, if, if you really can't think of why you need client ID, the API won't force you to set it. So you can uh, uh, leave that unset. And if you, in, over in Java EE land, is that for an MDB, the uh, container will actually generate your subscription name for you if you want it to be the name of the MDB. So that's just an ease of use, it's something that a lot of vendors already do. Uh, another new feature, delivery delay. You can think of this is this is a, an example of a feature that a lot of vendors already have, um, and we're just trying to standardize it. Um, and this is basically allowing a JMS application to specify uh, that a message won't be delivered until a certain length of time has elapsed. And uh, the API is very similar to uh, expiry, setting the JMS expiry. There's a method on JMS producer, or indeed on, JMS, on message producer or JMS producer to just pass it in. Another feature that's coming in is an async send. This is actually a Java SE feature because it's uh, uh, rather than a, an app server feature. And it allows you to, well, at the moment, what happens when you send a message, a persistent message, is that the contract, quality of service contract, is you call send. And then what should happen is, in a typical client server implementation, though we don't define exactly that this is going to happen, is that you'll send the message to the um, to the server, and then the server will write to a persistent store. When that's finished, it'll send the acknowledgement back to the client. Meanwhile, while all that's happening, the client's call to send is blocked and waiting for it. That's a typical imp implementation. And what, we'd like, what we want to allow is for the acknowledgement to come back asynchronously. So what that means is that you, 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 uh, you call send, you send the message, and then effectively, once it's on the wire, that the method returns, and the application carry on and do something else whilst the acknowledgement is coming back. And then when the acknowledgement will come back a bit later, you can get, get a notification by calling a completion listener um, callback, where a completion listener is a simple callback method that's got an on completion and on exception methods. So basically, when the acknowledgement comes back, that the on completion is, is called, assuming it's successful, and then you know that basically the, mes the message was delivered and persisted with the same quality of service than if you just called an, an, an ordinary send. So the idea is that is that uh, um, that can allow that you can either allow you to set, to set a, send a whole stream of messages without waiting for the, the the acts to come back before you send the next one. You know they can come back asynchronously, so it can be quite useful when streaming a hot large number of messages together, and it can also be um, uh, uh, handy if you actually did know you wanted to do something else, some computation, while waiting for the acknowledgement. You know. Can, can I actually just carry on, because I think I'm running a little bit, at, you know, I'm going to run out of time. Um, I said there will be time um, tomorrow to talk about um, uh, any of these issues. Uh, another new feature is a modest change to make it easier to handle what I think are generally called poison messages. The issue about this is that if you're delivering to an MDB or indeed to a message listener, is that if, the, if for some reason the application doesn't quite, can't, can't handle the, um, uh, the exception, can't handle the message. Like, for example, it's trying to, I don't know, write it to a database and the database is down. All it can, what, how can it handle that? Typically what it would do is throw an exception back to the JMS provider. And then what happens is then the JMS producer just, uh, JMS provider just sends it again and again and again. And at the moment, the JMS, in, in the JMS spec, is effectively, that's all that happens is that, you know, so basically there's no way of saying, um, I can't handle this message, 
send it to a dead message queue or something like that, and I want to carry on receiving the next one. Um, now, there is a, I think there is a scope to add, say, dead message queue handling to JMS, but this, this isn't it. This is a much more modest feature, which is to basically allow an application to implement that themselves. And that's to... So, so, so the change that is coming to JMS 2.0 uh, is to actually force the, re require the JMS providers to actually tell, set a message property to say how many times have you actually delivered this message. And what that'll do, using that for the property, it's already in JMS 1.1 as an option. And what that'll do is um, uh, will allow the application to be able to say, hang on, I've had this message 10 times now, I clearly don't know what to do with it. So I can now write it to a dead message queue of my own, something like that. So it's basically a way of allowing frameworks or applications to develop their own dead message handling on top of JMS. Uh, and, and the last of these small changes to new messaging feature is a way of making consumption messages from a topic more scalable. At the moment, you, if you want to receive messages from a, um, a topic, you receive it through a subscription. You know, it basically represents your copy of all the, of the, t of all the messages on the topic. And um, at the moment in JMS, you can only have one thread consuming messages from that. You know, basically only one session can consume messages from that subscription. And basically what we're going to do in JMS 2.0 is allow you to have multiple consumers, multiple threads, all consuming messages from the same subscription, whether it's durable or non-durable. Uh, in the case of a dual subscription, existing API is all you need. You don't need a new API for that. We're just allowing you to create a second consumer on the same existing sub durable subscription, which at the moment will cause an error. In the case of uh, non-durable subscriptions, you do, need, you do need to be able to say which durable subscription are you trying to create the second consumer to. So we need to invent a new concept called the shared subscription name. So that's what that API is called. So that's, uh, so that's just a quick summary of some of the new features, new, gem, new messaging features, I could say. Um, there's also a, uh, a set of features, in set, uh, new set of features um, to uh, improve the use of JMS within um, Java EE. And I think I'm just going to just go to um, a couple of specific examples um, so I don't run too out of time. And the first is in, this is Java EE application now, there's a new... Um, I mentioned this before, there's a new uh, feature called a def platform default connection factory. So in, again, in, if you're running an app server, the, you know, an app server always has a built-in JMS. That's part of the contract of being an app server. So it knows where its JMS provider is. So uh, uh, it, it always was rather slightly pointless in that case of expecting the application to create a connection factory that actually just said, well, use your own because the app, the app server knows it already. So there will now always be at least one built-in connection factory called JMS with that name, which the application can just use. So, you know, if you want, so basically you can just, if you want to inject that uh, connection factory using that, that resource, and that connection factory, it'll always exist. You don't need to create it. The other new feature that's coming into JMS uh, 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 2.0 and Java e, um, 7 is a, a way of making it easier to, for an application developer to actually define the uh, JMS resources they, their application needs. At the moment, the uh, application defines the, uh, just uh, says, I, has the at, in, at resource annotations that says I want a, uh, a JMS queue or a, queue, queue or a topic or a connection factory to be at this JNGI name, but, there's n but the job of actually creating them is just left to the deployer or the administrator. What these annotations, these are now will do uh, is allow the application to actually in define what JMS resources they're expecting. So uh, uh, in this case, the top one is to define a JMS connection factory, the bottom one is a queue or topic. And, typi and essentially the, the idea here is that the, um, you could, is that the, Application developer could define enough information to completely define the uh, queue or topic here. However, the, that's not terribly portable because that would typically, part of the definition of these is, you know, is uh, implementation, is dependent on the installation. So the general idea is that the um, uh, application developer uh, specifies the, the sort of portable aspects of it, like, for example, they're expecting a connection factory 
of a certain class or expecting a queue of a certain name. And they do that using annotations. And then the deployer fills in all the gaps, all the missing information using new um, uh, uh, JMS elements, JM, so, uh, XML elements in the um, deployment descriptor. So in that case, in fact, the bottom example would be the uh, connection factor, they're defining the, uh, the host and the port of where the JMS is, for example. So, um, so the idea is then is that the generic information is provided about the requirement is provided in the code using annotation, and then the, uh, the rest of the deployment specific information is added by the, by the um, deployer at deployment time. And then those pieces of information together can be used by the container at deployment time to automatically create the resources you need. Um, rather than having to use administrative tools or whatever. I'm going to go through these fairly quickly, but uh, one of the things, um, uh, another feature that's coming in JMS Tilpin Nord is just catching up on some standardization gaps. So I think I'm going to go through this fairly quickly, but basically there's a number of properties of a MDB that are just not standard at the moment, even the, even, which is perhaps a bit of a surprise. So we're just going to standardize some of these things. You probably thought were standard already, which is an API to define the, um, so this is a message-driven annotation for an MDB in the RBE, and there's going to be a new standard property to define where to find the connection factory. A new standard property, sorry, that was the, uh, sorry, the, the queue or topic that you're coming from. Uh, here's a new a standard property to define what connection factory to use. Uh, here's a standard property to define the client ID and the job description name. These are all things that you might have thought were standard already, and indeed, most JMS vendors already support those, but they weren't standard. They weren't mandatory before to support them. These now will be. Um, I think the final thing I really want to say about uh, Java e, uh, JMS in Java e is uh, one of the key things about JMS is that it's a, it's a technology to allow one application server, well, t one system to talk to another. So it is uniquely the one use case where you might actually want to talk to a foreign application server. Um, you know, if you want to have and one application running in one app server wanting to talk to another application in another app server, you might actually need, if these two application servers are using different technology, one was Glassfish and one was WebLogic, you might, you might actually want to send a message to it, like the foreign app server. And the, uh, the key thing to, uh, to enable that is um, we want to make it easier to... Um, to basically plug in, for in an application server, to actually plug in a, some other foreign uh, app, uh, JMS provider. Uh, so, for example, you might want to have, uh, an, if you've got a Glassfish application, if you wanted to send messages to, I don't know, WebLogic JMS, you might want to, um, uh, from your Glassfish code, that's something that is not, um, uh, that we're trying to make that much more as an, as, as an expectation in the code, the ability to, to basically use one JMS provider in another app server. And we're going to do that by basically making it mandatory to, uh, for, it, for each JMS vendor to provide a resource adapter that can be plugged in. So this is the JCA, this is the JCA um, architecture, defines this concept of a this, uh, component called a, 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 um, a resource adapter, which basically is, uh, is a sort of portable unit that you can plug into an application server. And so uh, a lot of JMS providers already provide a resource adapter to allow, at least in principle, their JMS to be used in applications running in different application servers. And uh, what we're basically going to do is to give that, um, give that the full support of JMS by actually requiring it. So this is a summary of what's new in JMS 2.0. I mentioned simplicity, ease of use, some new features, scope for, for many more, some, uh, some better tools and specifications for Java e integration, some clarifications I didn't go into detail. If you're interested, uh, this is where you find out more. There's going to be a demonstration at the, uh, in fact, the, this afternoon at the uh, uh, demo grounds in Hilton of some of these features in, in, in action at the uh, Simplified API. Uh, there's a bot tomorrow where those of you who had questions that I haven't answered, please come back and give me a hard time, and the others a hard time about those then, because that's a good opportunity to talk about these features and all the things that, let, that we haven't done. Uh, the draft API is available on that website. The slides of this talk will be at that website, jms-spec.jav.net. And there's a event list to come 
uh, you can get involved if you want to. And please do try the latest glassfish um, builds. Um, and I think, uh, oh, there's just a reminder that there's a boff tomorrow. Um, I think that's probably, I'm out of time, so thank you very much.